So we are going to start. We're going to start with, um, let's see here. Okay. We're going to start with defining aggression. So aggression really is uh, hostile actions towards others, self, or objects. And by objects, it can be, you know, walls or throwing things, turning over chairs or anything like that. And it can really vary from person to person, even from environment to environment. So for some people, it might be very mild. It might look like just someone being in your physical space, you know. For others, it could really be the other extreme where what it is is it's, it's threatening the safety of the people involved. So um, aggression is an indicator that the individual is uncomfortable or stressed and has unmet needs. So this is a topic that's close to my heart. I have two children. My youngest has complex needs, um, which includes autism. And we, we, she was diagnosed with autism when she was around three just before her third birthday, and we managed pretty well until we hit adolescence. And then we saw this emergence of aggressive behavior. And there's lots of things going on during adolescence. There's lots of stresses, and your bodies are changing. And um, this was sort of out of our skill set. We didn't really know what we were going to do. Because there were instances where we knew we needed to step in and keep her safe, so if she was banging on a window, we knew we had to intervene, but we didn't really know what we, you know, how we were going to do this. So we muddled around on our own for a little while, and then we realized, okay, we need to reach out. So what we did is we managed to wiggle our way into a class, a CPI class. I don't know if that's familiar to any of you, if you've ever heard of this. This is a crisis intervention program, and we wiggled our way into that. It's mostly for... Um, in uh, organizations that they use this and so they went through different things and one of the things was you know when when it when the situation breaks down and there is a threat to safety you would step in and use physical restraints and so we found that this was a challenge for us our message to our daughter all along was always to keep your hands to yourself to not be hurting anybody you have to you know, keep your hands to yourself. And yet, when things broke down, we were jumping in there and trying to hold her to keep her safe. So we knew this wasn't quite going to work for us. So we knew we needed a plan. We needed a safe and respectful response when things uh, turned into a crisis. And we knew we had an ethical duty to, do, to use the least restrictive response possible. And, you know, we needed to keep everyone safe, but we wanted to make sure that we were, we were doing what made sense. So our mantra was, keep your hands to yourself. We needed to demonstrate that. We needed to model that. So we also knew that we needed to help her understand that it was her job to return to a calmer state. So it shouldn't be us running in, grabbing her, then letting go, okay, you're calm now, then holding her again. No, the onus needed to be on her. And so that's how we came up with this plan. And the plan has been very successful. So the plan, what it incorporates is early recognition and prevention of these escalating aggressive symptoms. And a lot of that will probably be familiar to you. So it's looking at the things that may be causing stress. So it's looking at communication, because often for our kids, communication is a big deal. Even your kids who have a, have a lot of words, especially when they're in a heightened state, they're not always able to do, to share what it is that's upsetting them. So it's communication, sensory challenges, I'm going to talk about each of these, and um, uh, the plan also incorporates relaxation and behavioral strategies. And so it's about respecting the individual's dignity and their personal space using these safety mats instead of stepping in. It's a bit of a, it's a hands-off intervention and it's a bit of a change from what um, is typically done out there. But parents are always the best ones to get on board, I have to say, because we're motivated to not be restraining and doing those kind of things. So there's reports of aggressive symptoms all over um, media. I don't know if anyone's on Twitter, but I am on 
Twitter, at a kinder way plan, and um, retweet lots of stories. It's in hospitals that restraints are used. It's in schools. It's in group homes. And you know, like this this last article here. Um, that's out of a Toronto, and it's talking about group homes in Toronto. In one in three SOs, so serious occurrences, um, would involve the use of restraint. One in three. So, um, you know, it, it's time that we sort of shuffle up how we manage aggression, I think. So, the impact on caregivers, if they're, if the individual you care for is experiencing aggressive symptoms, the impact on caregivers is really enormous. Aggress aggression is the thing that causes caregivers to reach the limit of what they can do. You know, we work around a lot of things, but aggression kind of brings us to a stop. You know, so um, there's, it, it, it's important for us to, um, to recognize that when we're, as caregivers, when we're in that position, we are under a great deal of stress, and our bodies are reacting to this stress all the time. I had a mom recently tell me that during her, her son's morning care, um, he says something and he wants her to repeat something back. And they go back and forth like this. And she said she's terrified because she knows if she gets it wrong, he blows up. That's a lot of stress, right? That's a lot of stress. So. Um, we have to recognize that our bodies are reacting to this stress, we get this release of stress hormones, we're more prone to have challenges ourselves, our own health challenges. So there's an interaction between aggressive symptoms and stress, of course. The more aggression you're, you're exposed to, the more stress you're feeling. But there's an interaction the other way too. So as a caregiver, if you're feeling stressed, it's more like, there have been some studies that show that it's more likely that you're going to see more aggression. So it's a back and forth thing. Um, the caregiver's calming influence cannot be overstated. It's so important that we model uh, calmness, even when things are, um, are stressful and looking like they're going to be out of control. If we are getting upset and doing like, you know, that parent thing that we sometimes do when we're like, if you don't, oh, you'll never do whatever again, that parent thing isn't that helpful. So what we need to be doing is we need to be um, making sure that we look like we are in control, making sure that we are looking like we're calm, making sure that we are looking like it's okay. Because if the individual that you're caring for looks at you and you look like you're out of control, then they're gonna be like, well, there's gotta be a good reason for all of us to be out of control here. And it just kind of feeds into each other, right? So we're gonna model this nice calm, it's all about looking calm. This one, I think is up and that's okay. So um, it's hard to know how widespread these aggressive symptoms are in the home because in homes we typically don't do all the documentation that they do in other organizations, right? Whether it's hospitals or schools or group homes. So and, and parents underreport it. No parent wants to be standing here talking about aggression, saying my son did whatever, you know, or my daughter did whatever. So it really is a profound thing, you know, and it's not something that's talked about a lot. So that. I'm thrilled to be here to be talking about this because I think it's an important topic. You know, some of the things we feel is, uh, certainly I felt shocked. I remember the first, like I'm not talking about like an arm flailing, but I'm talking about an actual aggressive thing happening. I remember my daughter grabbed my hair and I was just shocked. I was like, oh. Um, and it's upsetting and exhausting and frustrating and isolating because we don't talk to everybody about it. And it's sad too. So. There are solutions. This is not going to be all sad. This is going to be, no. Um, there are solutions. So one of the things is we need to think about the stressors that are causing the individual to be aggressive. And so these may be internal or external stimuli. So it may be something, um, especially if the communication part isn't there, it may be you know, feeling hungry or feeling frightened or having some thought that's stressing them out. Or it could be something external for somebody who has some challenges with sensory stuff. It could be you know, a noise or a smell or banging. It could be from the environment. It could be social interactions. It could be you know, 
an interaction with a peer at school or not being included, right? All these things can contribute to stress. And um, it, it could be life threatening, there could be a big stress in their life, or it could just be subtle everyday occurrences. And sometimes the responses are the same for some individuals. You know, sometimes those, even a mild, subtle stressor may cause the same response as something enormous. So um, it could change depending on the environment. So this is when you get the call from school and they're saying something, you're thinking, of, what, that's never happened at home. But um, different environments, uh, you know, um, are stressful in different ways. So the, the thing to do is to really sit there and figure out what exactly is stressing the individual out. Like what is it that's going on in their lives? And making a list of this. What are their stressors? And this is helpful because you can share this with others. So if someone comes in and provides care, or if they go to a day program, or they go to a camp, or they go to school, wherever they're going, if you have a list, like a really clear list, of what stresses them out. So, um, you know, it might be too much language. You know, communication, we need to keep sentences very short, maybe one word or two words or whatever. It might be changes in routine, uh, transitions, not just one activity ending, but even just transitions from one room to another room. You know, um, that can cause, um, that kind of physical change in space can cause a lot of stress. Seeing someone else get upset, you know, that can be a big thing. Of course, sensory uh, processing challenges too. Like getting dressed, grooming, brushing teeth, all those things um, take a certain amount of um, calmness, right? And they can be stress provoking for some people. Making choices. We always think choices are good, but sometimes too many choices are just stressful. Malfunctioning equipment for my daughter. Oh my gosh, if something's not downloading. <laughs> Uh, you know, that's, that's a challenge for her. Physical needs, you know, just hunger and thirst and warmth and cold. We're not always really aware. We know we're not feeling comfortable, but we're not always aware of what it is. Health issues. This one's big, and this is where you would want to have a good relationship with your family doctor. Because dental caries, you know, cavities, wisdom teeth, headaches, um, you know, there's all kinds of things. Some kids that are on medications that cause gastric reflux. They don't know how to tell you that. You know, you know, they're not able to say, I need tongues, but that might be the case. They may have a burning sensation. You know, for a lot of kids, constipation, because their diets may not be exactly perfect, so they suffer with constipation. And that's, you know, terribly uncomfortable. So having your, your family doctor on board is super important. Even fatigue can be stressful. So when you have that list of the things that you think are stressing your child, then you, we, we can think about, well, what does that stress actually do? So, um, I mean, I'm giving a whole physiology lesson here, but just something to think about. So um, the part of our brain that initiates that hormonal response, this, the same response that I talked about in us when we're feeling stressed, um, can cause a whole change in the body. So it releases stress hormones, the heart rate goes up, the breathing goes up, and um, it's the hypothalamus, but now there's research that shows that it's the amygdala. And the amygdala is in the lower part of the brain. That's right in the brain uh, stem, and it's almost like a, refl a reflex. If you look at the curly, um, wiggly part of that brain, that's the cerebral cortex, and that's more thought of as the thinking part of the brain. So when you are responding to somebody who's in crisis, that thinking part of the brain, when they're in crisis, probably isn't doing that much work. It's more of a reflex that's happening. So if our strategies to help them through their crisis are involving that thinking part of the brain, then we're probably not going to be that successful. So Having a conversation, the bargaining, the reminding, remember, all of that is probably not going to help. What we're going to do is we're just going to zoom right in and just focus on that breathing. All yogis will tell you, breathing is the key to relaxing. So, the 
response that people usually have is that whole fight or flight or freeze response that I just talked about on the last slide. And this response for some individuals can really be hardwired to be overactive. You know, like, like the same thing could happen to two people, but one person is like in crisis. And I know certainly from my daughter, when I think about the things that can set her off, sometimes I can't, I haven't a clue what set her off. It didn't seem like there was anything going on. But for her, I would think that that part of her brain is just easily triggered. And we do know that there are genetic, hormonal, neurochemical susceptibilities that leave people more likely to have aggressive responses to stress. Some people, their brains are a little different, their levels of hormones are different. So I guess for me, this is helpful, this information is helpful in helping me understand that my daughter's not willfully doing terrible things. You know, this is maybe a part of her biology, and I actually think she works very, very hard to not be doing um, aggressive, you know, acting out in, a, in an aggressive way. So the other part of aggression that I have to mention, in case there's any people who are having behaviorists in the room, is that there is a link, uh, a relationship between behavior that happens and reinforcement. And um, there's a learned component. So if I have a task ahead of me that is a dreadful task that I'm worried about doing or I don't want to do, and if I throw things and get upset and then that task doesn't happen, there's a learned response, right? I can get out of doing that task if this happens. So I think there's a real mix between the biology and the learned part. I think it's complex. So have a little bit of understanding of what's going on. And so um, but we defined aggression, we talked about those stressors, um, we talked about the impact on the caregivers, and we talked about the response, the body response. Now I'm gonna talk about what we do about this. So the first thing I think that's super helpful, well the first thing is we're gonna make a list of the things that we think are stressing the individual. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create kind of a roadmap of what it looks like for the person you care for. And we're gonna put it, categorize it into level one, two, and three. And level one is low signs of stress. And it may seem simple, it may, it may seem unnecessary, I guess is what I'm trying to say, but this can be so helpful. Level two would be moderate levels of stress, and level three, high. And when I talked about how at home, we rarely keep track of, um, of uh, we don't document the way they do in other environments. This is a way to document that makes it very, very easy. So if you think about your, your, the child you care for and you think about what they look like. For my daughter, under level one, and this is just low signs of stress, she has a nervous smile, which is very often misinterpreted because it looks like a smile. Um, so it's helpful when I tell somebody, you know, if she's smiling and you're hearing some humming and she's not really looking at you, she's probably stressed. And this can be shared with school, this can be shared with camp, this can be shared with your doctor. Um, when you are documenting this, once you get those three levels sort of organized, you can just use it, if you're a paper person or a phone person, get your calendar and just put on June 19 a number one, because you saw a level one. You know, you can look back at your calendar if you do that each day and very simply see, oh, in May, we saw three level threes. In uh, June, we didn't see any level threes. What do we do? <laughs> what do we do to, you know, this is a very simple way to keep track. And I guarantee you, any of the professionals coming into your home, when they, when you tell them, this is, this is what I've, this is what I've tracked, they're going to be delighted. They're going to be delighted that you have this information. I'm sure. <laughs> they're going to say, oh, that's a good idea. Um, the other thing is, is if there is a change, so when school ends, for some individuals there's a seasonal change. 
you know, and if you have that on a calendar, and I'm not talking about writing down all each every little thing that happened, but just numbers, one, two, and three. And when you look at that calendar, I'm sure you're going to see, ah, this is where something's going on. This is where something changed. Even going to your family doctor, or if you have a psychiatrist on board, you know, very often medications are changed, and we kind of, we, we trust our memories, because if in the last week it was a nightmare, when we go back to see the doctor, we say, oh, that is not working. You know, but if you're pulling out your calendars and looking at it, you have a much better um, understanding if it did in fact work. Like maybe just the past week something else was cooking. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, so the preventative strategies, and that's what this whole plan is really about. It's less about these mats. It's really about the preventative strategies. Two things, reducing the stressors, so if you know what they are, we're going to do our best to reduce them, to minimize them, even eliminate them, and regaining composure, getting to a calmer state. So in terms of reducing stressors, it is um, a little bit artificial in that this is not life. In life, there are stressors. But if you have an individual who is having level threes over and over and over, we need to have a week or a few days or maybe even a few hours where we address those level threes. And maybe we need to take all those stressors out of their life as best we can. Let them have a good run and then build on that, if that makes sense. Yes, we will introduce stressors as time goes on, but once they have more skills to manage, they will be able to have more stressors in their life. So again, the regaining composure, the onus is on them, and everybody can learn um, some of these calming strategies. So again, I'm just going over those scene four things. Well, actually, medication I won't talk about too much, but uh, communication, sensory support, relaxation and reassurance, and then medication. Medication's at the end because it's kind of a, a complicated a complicated topic. So um, in terms of communication, um, there's really all kinds of very simple uh, visuals you can use to help. And I don't know if this is all old hat to you guys or if you know if you already use these kind of things. My daughter reads really well, so I have the luxury that I can put things like this in front of her. So she does not access her words readily, but she reads well. So if she reads them and they're there for her, she can then tell us what she wants. Long process to figure that out well. But, so I use a lot of written words prompts, but there's all kinds of things you can, you can use. I'm going to pass some of these around. And I use... Um, just, I'm going to start over here and I can just pass around. I, if you go to make simple things, either using pictures, words, whatever works for your child. Um, there's, and uh, in terms of communication, it's a speech language pathologist who's really the pro with this. And they're going to be the ones who can come in, do full assessments, but there's stuff we can do in the meantime if we don't have access to a speech language pathologist. So, I go on to Google Images. There are all kinds of images for everything you can imagine. Everything you can imagine. And I don't even have a laminator at home. Honest to goodness, I have an iron. And I put, I print off the picture I want. I do buy those sheets to laminate, but I only buy the sheets. I stick it on the iron and I iron. I put a, a cloth over it and I iron and they come out just fine. So this is really simple stuff we can do, and you would be amazed how helpful it is. And for some individuals, they're happy to be involved in this, so they might want to color the things that you're printing out. Um, I have some examples here. So um, you might use these as a choice. You might be giving someone a choice. You may be using this, like this clothesline here, I think is a super cute idea. We're talking about trying to reduce stress. So if I know what's happening in my life, I have less stress. 
So I like my calendars. I like to know everything that's going on. And sometimes we forget, like we're running around super busy and we forget to tell the person that's the most involved in the rest of the day what exactly is happening. So this is a way to sort of remind ourselves, right? The other thing too is even just, if you see this strip here, um, it's a bedtime thing. Um, and no, I didn't make that. This is just off of uh, Google Images. So easy to find everything. Um, if you send somebody and say, okay, go get ready for bed, and there's this void of what do I do, and they end up doing other things, and you know, 20 minutes later you're checking in and nothing's happening, and then you might be checking in and there's a big upset. Just to have a little schedule, depending on what the individual you care for um, is most comfortable with. Some people like check off things. You know, whatever works, whatever works, that's, you know, kind of, and this is, um, this is really, in the absence of a speech language pathologist, we can do some of these things, but of course having a speech language pathologist on board is a great idea if we can do it. Um, the one thing that um, I, 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 you'll probably see as they go around, I have, I might have more and finished in there. And the one thing that for a lot of kids is, that is very stressful is activities that do not have an ending. So a movie might have a beginning and an ending, but sitting on the computer, I mean, we can all experience that, right? It's like, oh, I've been on here forever. There's no ending. And for those guys, sometimes the way to end the activity is to throw something. Because they're waiting, they're waiting, they're waiting. They're just not able to initiate the ending of something. So sometimes having a more finish, or just asking them, do you want more or are you finished? That's something that, um, <coughs> You know, if you stop and think about it, it's intuitive, but it, 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 it doesn't always seem, um, it's not always that obvious. So that's communication. Communication is huge, and again, we're trying to reduce stress, right? The things that are stressing individuals out, we're trying to reduce them. So the next area where we can look at stress is um, sensory integration. Um, all of us, process the information that our senses take in. So while we're standing here, there's lots going on. You're listening to me. You're sitting in a chair. There's lots of information going on. Some of us have a reduced awareness, and some of us have a heightened awareness. For individuals who have developmental delay, there's often this coexisting condition of sensory integration disorder. Often, not always, but often. And that's why I think it's important to talk about it. So individuals who have a reduced awareness, these may be the, the, the people who are seeking um, sensory input. So they may be spinning or jumping, swinging. Um, they don't really have, they have a lack of awareness of, of danger. My daughter, she's just little, both my daughters. One was like, is this sanitary? Like she's super careful about everything. The other one, just plowed into things. She'd be the one who would climb up to the top of the slide. She's standing on the handlebars at the top of the slide. No sense of danger, no awareness of that. These are sometimes the people who have like food on their face, just not aware of that type of sensory thing. The other side is heightened awareness. And these are my daughter who's going, is that sanitary? And she, She's she's the neurotypical one, <laughs> but anyways, we're we're all in we're all somewhere on this continuum, and so the person who has a heightened awareness may get carsick, may you know be hesitant around playground equipment, may be hesitant around certain food textures, hesitant around clothing, like some clothing is just uncomfortable for them, and this causes a great deal of stress for them, so. Just to kind of um, continue on this sensory theme, so our senses are touch and visual, auditory, what we hear, olfactory, or what we're smelling, taste. Vestibular is our sense of, of balance. Proprioceptive is where our muscles are in space. And introceptive is uh, sort of a newer one, and that's understanding when we're feeling hungry or pain, those internal things in your body. And so if you have um, a reduced awareness, you, 
you know, you might have a big cut or something and you'd say, look, you're cut. No, <laughs> right? So, um, uh, it's important to understand that for each of those senses, you could have heightened or um, a heightened sense or a reduced sense. And it could, for the same individual, they could be heightened in one area and reduced in the, in the other. So just to give you an idea, so if you were stepping into a canoe, you would receive information um, that your foot is on the bottom of the canoe, your sense of touch, your vision would help you know that the canoe is lower than the dock, your proprioceptive and your vestibular would help you lower your body into that canoe. So somebody who has um, uh, a higher sense of awareness may be terrified of that activity. Whereas someone on the other end of that spectrum would probably go galloping to the, to the edge of the lake, hop right in, and end up in the lake. So it's just, as we move forward, thinking about our, the people that we care for, you, have to, you, you kind of have to look at them. An occupational therapist is the person who, who's got sensory training, who can assess and, um, and really give you a breakdown of exactly for each of the senses where the individual is. But even without an occupational therapist on board, you can still, you know, if the individual is at supper time sitting there holding their nose, you, you can understand that the smell of the cooking is overwhelming for them. If somebody's walking around like this, then they're trying to manage what they're hearing, right? So it's looking for these cues, and we're trying to help reduce their stress. So for my daughter, she is overwhelmed by the whole cooking thing, so I try and cook before she's home. You know, if I can do that, I do it, and it actually works out okay. So it's really about reducing the stress, thinking about all those communication ways to do it, think about the sensory processing, and um, hopefully we're going to be able to take away some of the stress they're feeling. So um, I think you probably saw some of the cards have um, breathing exercises. So the thing about breathing is that it, we know what's happening in the body when we're stressed. So if we can undo that quick breathing, we are going to be on the road to um, feeling a little bit more relaxed. We teach breathing during calm, teachable moments. So we're not going to be able to teach this when the individual is upset. Um, we have to choose our moments beforehand. We model this calm breathing. And um, even when the environment changes, we may teach it all over again. Or if it's a different caregiver, we may teach it all over again. Because we want the individual to know, we know how to help you relax. Whoever's looking after you in this moment knows how to help you relax. So this is a relaxation exercise. Um, it's simple. And even when you think, no, I couldn't teach this, it can be taught. I've seen people do this, that it, it's amazing. And I've seen them initiate it themselves. You know, so what it is, maybe we can do it. Maybe we can do it together. It's, uh, this is taken from um, um, Anxiety Society in BC. So it's taking in a slow, deep breath through your nose for four seconds, holding it for two, and then exhaling for four. Waiting a few seconds and breathing again. So it's slow, smooth, regular breaths. Sitting upright with your arms resting if you can. That helps your ribcage expand. And um, when we practice it, we don't use a lot of language because that's lots to process, right? So it's like, it's like this. For um, some kids, we just model it. We just stand there. Sometimes a card. Sometimes, uh, you know, whatever, whatever's going to help them know it's time to do this. And when you practice it in those calm moments, it transfers to the moments that are um, stressful and uncomfortable in a crisis. And, you know, we all don't want to feel like we feel when we're in a crisis. It's a terrible feeling, right, when you're distressed. So everybody's motivated to, um, to um, get to a calmer state. 
So the other thing we do, very, very simple, is coined hands. And so the, how this came about is, it's hard to relax. It's hard to be aware that you're stressed and that you're holding tension in your neck and your shoulders and your face and all that. Some people are very zen and very yoga-like and can do all that, but not all of us can. And so for individuals who maybe have sensory challenges, who are already not that in tune with how they're feeling, it's even harder. So what this is, is if everybody puts their hands together and you put a lot of pressure, pull them really tight, and then release that. You actually feel that right into your arms. And if you're lucky enough, you may even feel it right into your shoulders. So you hold it tight and release. There are a lot of sensory neurons in your hands, a lot. So that's helpful to help you feel that difference between the tension and the relax. That's paired with the breathing, right? So we do those soft hands, and we're gonna take a big breath, hold it, and anybody can do this. That's a nice thing, anybody can do this. The really wonderful, so there are other exercises, and if there's another exercise that works better, that's great. The challenge with some of the exercises is, especially blowing ones, we're really tense and we're like, <laughs> and we don't want someone hyperventilating. We really don't. So, um, because that causes a really big commotion if you pass out, right? So, um, I find this is tried and true, and it really does work. So, one day, I was, at, we made arrangements that I would pick my daughter up at the pool. She would go swimming with her class, but the bus ride home was a nightmare, so I said, I'll come get her. So I could hear her as I walked in the building, because it echoes too, but I could hear her. And I thought, oh. So I go running in, and I look. And it wasn't planned. It was an uncoordinated joint effort. Every one of the staff was standing around the pool trying to help her. Everybody had their soft, kind hands, and I was like, Yes. So it's something that's really easy to do. The wonderful thing is you can gauge how stressed the individual is. When you see white knuckles, you know they're stressed. When you see those nice relaxed hands, it's like, oh, that's good. The other thing is that when I talked about the signs of stress, for my daughter now, this might be a sign of stress. So she, without me even knowing she's stressed, I look. And she's got her hands like this, and I see her. So I kind of do a quick check, you know, like is there stuff I can help with? Is there a lot of noise? Can I, you know, ask someone to go somewhere else and have their busy conversation? Like, what can I do to help her? Because that is now one of her signs of stress. She's self-regulating using that. So it's really, really super helpful. The other thing we can do is, um, it's okay if I go over a little bit? Oh, yeah. Okay, the other thing that we can do is reassurance. And we sometimes forget this part, right? It's trying to keep those misappraisals or those cognitive distortions about how important a given incident is, keeping that in check. So if you dump your coffee, you dump your coffee. And, you know, there are some of us who go, everything is ruined, right? The whole day is ruined. And in all honesty, it's not. It really isn't. It feels like that in the moment, but it isn't. So shaping your inner dialogue, like shaping the conversation in your head, right? Maybe by, and it's interesting that thankfulness can sometimes negate anxiety. So maybe thinking, I'm really thankful they didn't land on me. I'm thankful I'm not burnt. But it's, it's a simple thing. And for some people, helping them see that. Reassuring them that, you know what, last time you dropped your coffee, we managed. We picked it up, it was okay. For some individuals, it's going to be even more simple than that. It might just be, in that moment, you might just say, you're okay. You got this. You can do this. Whatever it is, right? Just, get, just helping them feel that... You know, giving that bit of reassurance to help them change that conversation of everything is ruined. You're going to think about my, my picture now when somebody loses their cool. All right. So medication, I'm not going to talk a lot about it. That's a discussion between you and the doctor. But sometimes when there are aggressive symptoms, that is a conversation that has to happen. 
you know, it's for quality of life, right? Because when there are aggressive symptoms, the person's social circle just keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, and sometimes their transportation to school has been canceled, the school is sending them home on a break, these kind of things are happening. Doesn't mean that that's where you're going. Um, there's lots of considerations, but it's a conversation with the prescribing physician. The one thing I will say about that, and I mentioned it before, but I'll mention it again because it's worthwhile, is just remember to keep track of those level one, two, and three. If you're looking at medication, keep track of what's happening so you know if it actually works. If it doesn't work, you don't want to be doing it. Okay, so. In terms of behavior and reinforcements, I talked a little bit about it, but I'll just talk a tiny bit more and then we'll carry on. Behaviors are likely to increase if they're positive by a, a, if they're followed by a positive event or we take away something negative. And they're likely to decrease if we take if we take away a positive event or it's followed by a negative event. So there is this relationship between what happens and what happens after that happens. So it's important to realize that. Sometimes there are aggressive symptoms to escape from doing things that are really undesirable. Sometimes it's to gain attention. Sometimes it's to gain what's called a tangible or something desirable. So if your child is having an upset, throwing things, getting really distressed, and we start a whole bargaining process of what new you know, computer game they can have, this probably isn't a great idea because you're really giving them something great in response to what happened. So that kind of bargaining and talking down, and I, we don't do any of that. Um, of course, the other part to this is the sensory and internal part, and I think that's a big part of aggressive behaviors too. So really, it's about um, it's about you know understanding that this aggressive response is complex. It's not uh, it's not just someone being bad or someone just trying to get something. It's somebody who's probably trying to stay calm but isn't necessarily being successful without um, some help. So, we talked about all the, all the things that we would do to help them. Oh, there's my, yeah. Um, it is, I think, often unplanned, reactionary, impulsive, and driven by intense emotion, rather than having a clear purpose. And I truly believe this. No child wakes up and says, today I'm gonna hurt my mom. No child says that, or I'm gonna hurt my teacher. This is a reactionary thing. So our best practice as caregivers is to be aware of how all these behavioral principles can impact a crisis station, a crisis situation, but also recognize that it's complex. So what do we do when all the things we've talked about don't work and things still fall apart? What do we do? So this, these are the steps to the intervention. And this is a much smaller part. Like really the preventative part is really the big part to this. So um, we think about prevention and preparation. We respond to the crisis. We regain control and recovery. And there's some debriefing and rebuilding of your relationship. Fortunately with the mats, the rebuilding is so much easier because we haven't been in there struggling. So the rebuilding part is much easier. So, here we go. We're going to anticipate the crisis. We're going to look for those stressors we talked about. We're going to recognize those level one to three. We're going to do some preventative strategies, whatever we can, address physical and sensory needs, minimize stressors, you know, make that communication a little bit easier. We're going to prompt the relaxation and we're going to offer some reassurance. When the crisis happens, um, we want to make sure that we're using the uh, least restrictive intervention possible. We want to respect their space. I say this all the time, step back. Step back, give them space. Step back when they're out of control, step back. Um, we want to decrease the sensory processing load. So as caregivers, that's not when we're going to start a whole big conversation. You know, no, 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 we're not going to do this again. Remember last time? We're quiet during this process. 
and we're going to decrease positive attention. So if there's people around, we're going to send them maybe out of the room. You might want it. If they're siblings, you might want to say, you know what? I'd like you to go to your room while your brother or sister tries to manage the situation. And, um, you know, I'll come get you when, you know, just get everybody out of the way. So we're not all standing around watching the event that's happening. Um, you're going to prepare yourself. So you have to position yourself for safety. It depends on what's happening in your home. If it's, you know, if it's, if we're talking about a very small child, then, you know, you probably don't need to make sure you're close to an exit, but it depends on the situation. For some of us, we have adult children, and, you know, and uh, their adrenaline's flowing, and they're strong. So um, you have to think about your own safety. You need to keep them in sight. You're modeling calm behavior, no matter what. You have all your communication tools handy, so you don't have to use a lot of uh, talking. You can enlist support if it's possible. You can maybe tie your hair, make sure you don't have big creepy earrings. Those wouldn't work out well. So, um, like I said, you're going to ask people to leave who don't need to be there. And the first thing you have to do is you have to make sure that everybody's safe. So if somebody is having their hair pulled, the first priority is to make sure you free them. That's the first thing. Before you go running for mats or anything else, you, everybody has to be able to move away from the individual who's distressed. Um, once everybody's safe, you retrieve the mats. So um, you're going to put the mat between the individual and the property or the caregiver being targeted. And these mats, you know, I, I have really big mats and there's a reason for it. It's just easier. The mats are not seen as a call to arms or, you know, it's a battle cry. These mats can be anywhere. They can be tucked behind your sofa. They're really, what you're doing is you're just sliding. So if somebody was going to hit this wall, you would just slide the mat in front of the wall. Oops. You might just slide the mat in front of the wall so that, you know, and step back. So um, the mat should not touch the individual. We're not wrapping people in mats. We're not hurting them or moving them. We're not doing anything like that with the mats. We're just putting the mat or where they need to be. We're almost like bringing, uh, sometimes some people have an area in their home where it's sort of like a safer area where they might have mats on the walls. Or This is kind of a portable version of that. We're just bringing it where, um, where the individual is. Uh, any uh, contact with the mat from the is from the individual, not the caregiver. So. This is a, an example where uh, the individual is trying to keep the TV stand and the mat was just put in place. And the caregivers, even though they're both actually looking, <laughs> normally, I mean, you don't look away because you need to be using your peripheral vision to keep an eye on things, but we're just not putting a lot of attention on what's happening. We're letting that individual have the opportunity because they're in such a heightened state. They're not hearing us right now. They're not able to, to understand when we're saying, okay, let's have a breath. And they need to get to a bit of a calmer state than that. So what we're doing is we're putting them out there, letting them work it out, and then as soon as there's a lull, step in with the soft hands. So that's what's going on in this uh, image, in this image. Um, you can use multiple mats, so, uh, you know, it, sometimes the, the person isn't necessarily going to stay there. They may turn and, you know, multiple mats, you just slide the next one wherever you need it. Um, we slide them along the floor. Um, we stay with the individual if the individual's in motion. And again, we're not confining anybody. We're not, um, we're not uh, surrounding them with the mats or walking them into any place. We're moving with them. This individual was targeting the uh, drywall, and the caregiver moved with the individual, keeping the mats between the walls and the individual. Um, look how relaxed she is, right? And this is during a crisis. So these mats are good. These mats are going to keep the caregiver safe. They keep the individual safe. Works well. Um, once the individual is feeling more in control, 
then uh, feeling calmer, then you could uh, swoop in with your kind hands or, or your soft hands or your whatever you want to call it. It doesn't really matter. Um, the caregiver's quiet, models an uncontrolled presence, just like it's all good. You wouldn't even know anything was happening. We're just doing this. We're getting to a calmer place. We wait for signs of composure, like compliance before we move on. So we just want to make sure before we take all our mats away, that the individual truly is in a calmer place. So if you're prompting them to have calm hands and they're able to do that, that tells you that that thinking part of the brain that we talked about before is engaged again, right? And um, we can, you know, we uh, step back if the person sort of gets into a heightened state again. Sometimes we think we're ready, but we're not quite ready. And so you just get back again, and uh, we withdraw the mats when the individual is calm. And the relaxation exercises can continue until the individual can rejoin whatever they were doing before. The important part of rejoining, and of course, if they were coloring, that's not that critical. But if they were doing something that's one of those non-negotiable tasks, like brushing teeth, that's when you want them to rejoin that activity because we don't want it to be, well, I have an upset and then I don't have to brush my teeth ever, ever again, right? So it's, that's why the rejoining back to what they were doing is, is important. And um, the other thing about this too, I have to say, is it's a very sensory neutral um, thing. We don't put fancy decals on them. We don't decorate the mats. They are black and plain. They don't provide a lot of stimulation. So while you're trying to calm, if you were sitting on the floor in front of the mat, it's it's very neutral. So that's, that's an added thing. The other thing too is if there's clothing removal, and for some individuals, this is a part of their crisis type of, it provides a little bit of privacy if they're removing their clothes. So, um, I think it's important to be supportive and understanding. You know, I, I know for a lot of people who have aggressive symptoms, they're working really hard trying to manage, trying to manage the feelings they're feeling, trying to manage all the sensory input. I, you know, I offer reassurance because sometimes you see that worried look and I say, I'm okay. You know, we're all okay. We're moving on, right? Um, I acknowledge well, they're not okay. Well, Usually, someone has. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then you know what? Then you wouldn't say that I'm okay. But for me, when I see that the individual is so distressed about what they've done, I don't want them wallowing in that distress. But it is a judgment call, and you may, you know, you may not feel okay. Like if they've done some major damage in your house, everything is not okay. But we do want to move forward. If you, if you put a hole in the wall, it's not a big deal, that can be fixed. That's drywall can be fixed, you're going to learn how to drywall. You're my people. Okay. <laughs> but if you hurt somebody drywall. else, what if, you know, I don't know, bits, bits and bits like that, I think you know, there's, there should be some kind of consequence. And if they're sorry, you will. And it's part of it, they should apologize. Yeah. Once, once they're calm, not the right? And you know what? There is, there is that learning opportunity outside of the crisis, right? Yeah. Where you talk about. So you might make a story where you say, when I'm with my friend, you know, no, or I don't if bite my I don't. It may be that simple. We don't bite people, you know. Tommy doesn't bite. You know, it, but that I think is very much outside of this moment. This is a very emotionally charged moment. And so for some people, there's a great deal of remorse and dread and what have I done? And what might follow is hours of beating themselves up internally, you know, like in terms of their thoughts. And so sometimes that reassurance moves them forward. You're absolutely right. It's not okay to bite. It's not okay for any of these things to happen, but that I think you don't have that discussion with an unreasonable person. Like, really, you don't have a reasonable, reasonable person. Mm -hmm. Wait for the calm to do that. Mm -hmm. And for some people, you really see that distress, mm -hmm. like they're weeping or they're just like so overwhelmed with what they've done. 
you know. And I do think a lot of it, it was, you know, reactionary. I don't think they set out to fight somebody mm -hmm. that day, you know. Mm -hmm. I, 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 it is a judgment call, absolutely. And, and really a good point, really a good point. Um, I always acknowledge the focus and effort that that individual put into getting to a calmer state. I always do. You know, and often I offer reassurance and say, you know what? Tomorrow's a new day. Tomorrow we start fresh, and tomorrow will be better. You know, I'm not a big hang up on apologies or anything like that, but, um, you know, again, a lot of it's judgment, right? Like, you know your own child, you know what's going to work best, what doesn't. Um, the, the do's, it's. Um, I keep, the mats usually are just for interventions only because that's what you're using them for. And if the purpose of them becomes complicated, we don't want them to think in the middle of a crisis where it's saying, let's play, because it's not about playing at that point, right? So they're just kept just for the interventions. Easily accessible. I walked into uh, one of the group homes, the day program. And down the hallways, about every 10 feet were mats. And I was like, yes, 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 yes. I love that. Um, so you know, if they're in your environment all the time, like I said, they're not a cry to battle. They're just there. They're to help you. They're a part of what happens um, you know, to help you regain your composure. Um, they're really used as a non-threatening, de-escalating tool. Um, we minimize verbal exchanges if that's an issue. I think that's always an issue for everybody. Nobody ever calmed down because somebody was saying, calm down. Nobody calms down when someone yells that at them. So I think minimizing verbal exchanges is super important. And um, um, we minimize the attention and reaction to the behaviors. We place the mans between the individual and the, tar at the target of aggression. The don'ts is we don't confine people. We don't push, usher, guide, move them. We never wrap them in things. There was a case in Toronto a number of years ago now where um, a young lady suffocated. It was a beanbag they were using, and they were holding a beanbag on her, and she suffocated and died. We don't use mats in any way like that. You know, um, that's not what this is. Uh, we never, the other thing too is, we don't engage in a tug of war. So if you put the mat there and you're standing on this side because you want to stay safe and the individual decides, oh, we're going to fight over it, let the mat go and use a second mat. Just let it go. It's a mat. If it falls on them, it's not going to hurt them. Just pull a second mat in. You know, we don't engage. We're not, we're not doing that talking them down off the cliff. We're not negotiating. We're not bargaining. We're not offering up toys and wonderful things. None of that's happening. That's pretty much the mad intervention. Oh, I need to tell you a few of these old tricks. I just feel like I need to share these tricks with you. This is, um, if the TV is a target, it's pretty stressful, right? Like, you know, it's dangerous. So there are places like Christian Horizons has a grow studio where they do woodworking and they actually make these enclosures for TVs that are bomb-proof. And um, the second picture is, uh, for some people, uh, walking on the toilet. It'll break the toilet, like if you bang your back. So slipping a little pool noodle behind the tank of the toilet. You can't really see it in my picture, but there is a two pool noodle there. Slipping that behind the tank of the, um, between the wall and the tank may save your toilet. Like, um, we've changed a lot of toilets. Not anymore, though. Not anymore. Um, and the other thing is repair, you have to repair your drywall. You really do. Because it's almost like when you enter the room and there's a big hole, it's like, oh, that's what I do here. It's a reminder. You either, you, you know, you've got to cover it up. There's some really great products out there where it doesn't have to be perfect, but you get really good at drywalling. You know those sticky things that you just stick right on and then you plaster on top? It's not perfect, but it works. Because having that um, just exposed there is like a beacon. Oh, yeah, that's what I do. That's my little girl showing you her soft hands. I always ask Rachel if it's okay if I talk to other moms and dads. And she always says, yes. I said, can I take your picture and show them how you do your nice soft hands? She's happy for me to share that with you. 
and that's it. I've talked a lot.